Safety first, you and driver education. Sometimes, to tell a secret, you first have to teach a lesson. We're going to start our lesson off tonight on an early, warm summer evening in a parking lot overlooking the Beltsville Agricultural Farms in suburban Maryland. Less than a mile away, the crumbling concrete of the US-1 wends its way past the single-room revival churches, the porno drive-ins, and the boarded-up motels with for sale signs tumbling down. Like I said, it's a warm summer evening. Here on the land the Department of Agriculture owns, the smells of sleeping farm animals is thick in the air. The smell of clovers and hay mixing together with the smells of the leather dashboards. You can still imagine how Maryland used to be before the malls took over. This countryside was once dotted with farmhouses. From their front porches, you could have witnessed the Civil War raging on the front fields. Oh yes, there's a moon over Maryland tonight that spills into the car or sip a sad man old enough to be. Did I mention how still the night is? Damp soil and tranquil air. It's the kind of night that makes a middle-aged man with a mortgage feel like a young country boy again. It's 1969. I'm very old, very cynical of the world, and I know it all. In short, I'm 17 years old, parking off a dark lane with a married man on an early summer night. Um, I love the smell of your hair. Uh-huh. Oh, Lord. Um, a man could die happy like this. Well, don't. What shampoo is this? Herbal Essence. Herbal Essence. I'm going to buy me some of that, Herbal Essence. And when I'm all alone in the house, I'm going to get in the bathtub, uncap the bottle, and- Be good! What? Stop being bad. What did you think I was going to say? What did you think I was going to do with the shampoo? I don't want to know. I don't want to hear it. I was going to wash my hair, that's all. Oh. What did you think I was going to do? Nothing. I, I don't know. Something nasty. With shampoo? Lord, gal, you're mine. And whose fault is it? Well, not mine. I've got the mind of a Boy Scout. Right, a horny Boy Scout. All Boy Scouts are horny. What do you think the first merit badge is for? There. You're going to be nasty again. No, I'm good. Very good. It's getting late. Don't change the subject. I was telling you how good I am. Are you ever going to let me show you how good I am? Don't go over the line now. I won't. It's just... I've been good all week. You have? Yes. All week. Not a single drink. Good boy. Do I get a reward for not drinking? A small one. It's getting late. Let me undo you. I'll do you back up. All right, but be quick about it. You know, that's amazing. The way you can undo the hook through my blouse with one hand. Years of practice. You make an incredible brain surgeon with that kind of dexterity. Oh, I'll bet Clyde. What's the name of the boy taking you to the prom? Claude Souders. Claude Souders? I bet it takes him two hands, lights on, and you helping him on to get to first base. Maybe. Can I, can I kiss them, please? I, I don't know. Don't make a grown man beg. Just one kiss. I'm gonna lift your blouse. It's a little cold. <laughs> That's not why you're shivering. How's that feel? It's okay. I tell you, you can keep all the cathedrals of Europe. Just give me a second with these, these celestial orbs. 
Uncle Peck, we should get going. I have graduation rehearsal tomorrow at school, and you should get home to Aunt Mary. All right, little bit. Don't call me that no more. Anymore. I'm a big girl now, as you know. Bet you are. Going on 18. Kittens will turn into cats. I, I live all week long for these few minutes alone with you. Do you know that? I'll drive. Idling in the neutral gear. was the titless wonder, and my cousin Bobby got branded for life as BB. For real balls. And of course, we were so excited to have a baby girl that when the nurse brought you in and said, it's a girl, it's a baby girl, I just had to see for myself. So we whipped down your diapers and parted your chubby little legs. And right between your legs, there was just, just a little bit. And when you were born, you were so tiny that you fit in Uncle Peck's outstretched hand. Now that's a fact. I held you one day old right in this hand. Even with my family background, I was 16 or so before I realized pedophilia did not mean people who loved bicycle. Driving in first gear. 1969, a typical family dinner. <gasps> Look, Grandma, Little Bit's gonna be as big in the bust as you are. Mother, <laughs> Subject. Well, I hope you're buying us some decent bras. I've never had a decent bra growing up in the Depression, and now my shoulders are just crippled. Crippled from the weight hanging off my shoulders. The dance from my bra straps are big enough to put your finger in. Here, let me show you. Ooh, Grandma, please, don't undress at the dinner table. I thought the entertainment came after the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it always starts. My big papa will chime in next with, Yep, if Little Bit gets any bigger, we're gonna have to buy a wheelbarrow just to carry in front of her. Damn it! How about them Ritzkins on Sunday, Big Papa? The only sport Big Papa followed was chasing Grandma around the house. Uh, or maybe we could uh, write to Kate Smith, see if she has any uh, used brassiere she don't want no more. She can maybe give to Little Bit here. I can't stand it! I can't! Now, Little Bit, it's just their way. I tell you, Grandma, Little Bit's at that age. She's so sensitive, you can't say boo. I just like some privacy. That's all. Some goddamn privacy. Well, at least she didn't use the same as name. <laughs> well. Big Papa wouldn't let a dead dog lie. No siree. She better stop being so sensitive, because five minutes before a little bit turns the corner, her tits turn first. That's it! That's it! <laughs> little bitch, you can't let him get to you like that. Then he wins. I hate him! Hate him! That's fine. But hate him and have a good dinner at the same time? This gumbo is really good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, Little Bit's got a big surprise coming for her when she goes to that fancy college next fall. Big Papa, drop it. What does she need a college degree for? She's got all the credentials she needs right on her chest. Maybe I want to learn things. Read? Rise above my cracker background? Well, now, Little Bit. Yeah, what do you want to read? There's a whole semester course on, uh, for example, Shakespeare. <laughs> Shakespeare, yeah. How is Shakespeare going to help you in life? Well, I think it's wonderful. And on scholarship, how is Shakespeare going to help her lie on her back in the dark? You're getting old, Big Papa. You're going to die very, very soon. And when you get to heaven, God's going to be a beautiful black woman in a long white robe. And she's going to look at your chart and say, ah, uh oh, fornication. Dog, ugly me with blood relatives. Oh, mm, uh oh. Voted for George Wallace. Well, one last chance. If you can name the play, all will be forgiven. And then she will quote, the quality of mercy is not strained. Your answer? Ugh, oh, too bad. The Merchant of Venice, act four, scene three. And then she will send your sorry ass to Brian Helm with all the other crackers. Excuse me, please. And as I left the room, I would always hear Big Papa say, Lucy, your daughter's got a mouth on her. 
Well, no sense in wasting good gumbo. Pass me a plate, Mama. And Aunt Mary would come up to Uncle Peck. Peck? Go after her, will you? You're the only one she'll talk to when she gets like this. She just needs to cool off. Honey, please. Grandma's been on her feet cooking all day. All right. And as he left the room, Aunt Mary would say, Peck's just so good with them that they get to be this age. I don't suppose you're talking to family. Does it help that I'm in-law? You dare make fun of this. I'm not. There's nothing funny about this. But I'll bet when Big Papa meets his maker, he'll remember the Merchant of Venice. <laughs> Go get away from here. Oh, I'll go. Soon. Here. Take this. I hate this family. Your grandfather's ignorant. But you're right. He's going to die soon. And his family. Family is. Family. Grown ups are always saying that. Family. Well, maybe when you get older, you'll see what we're saying. Right, so. Family is another required piece. Like French kissing. Come again? You know, at first it really grosses you out, but in time you come to like it. <laughs> Girl, you are a handful. Uncle Peck, do you have the keys to your car? Where are you going? Just up the road. Well, I'll come with you. No, please. I I just need to drive for a little bit. Uh, alone. When can I see you alone again? Tonight. Shifting forward from first to second gear. There were a lot of rumors about why I got kicked out of that fancy school in 1970. Some say I got caught with a man in my room. Others say, as a town scholarship, I pulled a room with a rich man's daughter. I'm not talking. But the truth is, I had a constant companion in my dorm room who was less than discreet. A Canadian VO, a fifth a day. 1970, a Nixon recession. I slept on the floors of friends who were out of work themselves, took factory work when I could find it, a string of dead-end day jobs that didn't last very long. But what I did most nights, was cruise on the Beltway, on the back roads of Marilina, where there was still countryside, past the farmhouses and battlefields, racing in a 1965 Mustang. And as long as I had gasoline for my car and whiskey for me, the nights would pass. Fully taint, I would speed past the churches and the trees on the bend, thinking just one notch of the steering wheel would be all it would take. And yet some reflex took over. My hands on the steering wheel in the nine and three o'clock positions, I never so as much got a ticket. He taught me well. You and the reverse gear. Back up, 1968, on the Eastern Shore, a celebration dinner. Feeling better, Missy? The bathrooms here are really amazing, Uncle Peck. They have these little soaps instead of borax or something, and they're in the shape of shells. Well, I'll have to take a trip to the gentleman's room just to see. How did you find out about this place? Well, this inn is famous on the Eastern Shore. It's been open since the 17th century. And I know how much you like history. It's really great. And you just did your first legal long distance drive. You must be starving. That's an understatement. Well, I, I would suggest a dozen oysters to start in the Crab Imperial. You might be interested to know the, the history of this town. Back when the British sailed up this very river in the dead of night, you see outside where I'm pointing? They were going to bombard the heck out of this town, but the town fathers were ready for them. They crept up all the trees with lanterns, so the British thought they saw the town lights, so they aimed their cannons too high. And that's why the inn is still here for business today. That's a great story. Would you like a cocktail before dinner? Oh, uh, Uncle Peck, you're not going to start drinking again, are you? Not me. I told you, as long as you're with me, I'll never drink. I, I asked if you would like a cocktail before dinner. 
But I'm not legal. We could get arrested. Uncle Peck, they will never believe I'm 21. So? Today we celebrate your driver's license on the first try. You know, this establishment reminds me a lot of places back home. Why is that? Well, in South Carolina, like here on the Eastern Shore, they're, they're more European. Not so puritanical and very understanding if gentlemen wish to escort attractive young ladies who might want a before dinner cocktail. If you want one, I'll order one. Well, sure. Just one. A mother's guide to social drinking. A lady never gets sloppy. She may, however, get tipsy and a little gay. Never drink on an empty stomach. Avail yourself to the bread basket and generous portions of butter. Slather the butter on your bread. Remember, sip your drink slowly. Let the beverage linger in your mouth, interspersed with interesting, fascinating conversation. Sip. Never slurp or gulp. Remember, your glass should always be three quarters full when his glass is empty. Stay away from ladies' drinks, drinks like pink ladies, slow gin fizzes, gold Cadillacs, Long Island iced teas, margaritas, pina coladas, Mai Tais, Pepper's Punch, melon balls, blue balls, white Russians, black Russians, red Russians, hummingbirds, hemorrhages, and hurricanes. Mm. In short, stay away from anything with sugar or anything with an umbrella. Get your vitamin C from fruit. Don't order anything with voodoo or vixen in the title. And stay away from titles with sexual positions in the name. Names like Dead Man Screw or The Missionary. Believe me, whew, they are lethal. I think you were conceived after one of those. Ugh. Drink instead like a man, straight up or on the rocks with plenty of water in between. And don't mix your drinks, stay with one all night long like the man you came with. Bourbon, gin, or tequila till dawn. Damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. I hope you're all having a lovely evening. Is there anything that you said before you ordered? Well, I would like a plain iced tea. The lady would like a drink, I believe. Very good. And what would the lady like? Is there any sugar in a martini? None that I know of. That's what I'd like then. One martini, please. And could we maybe have some bread for the table? A, a drink fit for a woman of the world. Please bring the lady one dry martini. Be generous with the olives, straight up. Right away, sir. <laughs> Your glass is looking empty. Another one, madam? Yes, please. So, why did you leave South Carolina, Uncle Peck? Well, I was stationed in D.C. after the war and just decided to stay. <laughs> Don't know if young man someone might have said. What did you do in the service anyway? I, I did just this and that. Nothing very heroic or spectacular. But did you see fighting or go to Europe? I was in the Pacific Theater. Nothing very interesting to talk about. It is to me. Oh, Goody, I love the color of the swizzle sticks. <laughs> what were we talking about again? Swizzle sticks. Uh, no, do, do you ever think of going back? To the Marines? No, to South Carolina. Well, we do go back to visit. No, I mean to live. I don't think that's such a great idea to be a daily reminder of my mother's disappointment. Hey, are these floorboards slanted? Why, yes, the, the floor is very slanted. I, I think this is the original floor. Oh, good. Don't leave your drink unattended when you visit the ladies' room. There is such a thing as white slavery. The modus operandi is to spike an unsuspecting young girl's drink with a Mickey when she's left the room to powder her nose. But if you feel you've had more than your sufficiency in liquor, do go to the restroom. Often. Pop your head out the doors for refreshing breath of the night air. And if you must, wet your head and face with tap water. Dunk your head if necessary. Remember, a wet woman is still less conspicuous than a drunk woman. <laughs> In the course of human events, it 
becomes necessary, go to a corner stall and insert your index and middle finger, index and middle finger down the throat, almost to the epiglottis. Divulge your stomach contents by such persuasion. And then wait a few moments before rejoining your bow, waiting for you at the dinner table. Uh, no, don't be shy or embarrassed. There's always one or two debutantes crouched in the corner cells, their beaded purses tossed all willy-nilly, sounding like cats in heat, keeping up the contents of the stomachs. I wonder what it is they do in men's rooms. <laughs> Why you rather disappointed in your Uncle Fat? Well, every mother in Horry County has great expectations. Could I have another martini, please? <laughs> I think this is your last one. <laughs> so, the county where you grew up is it's called Hori. <laughs> oh man. Oh, I bet your mother loves you, Uncle Peck. <laughs> well, Mrs. She always wanted me to do to be everything that my father wasn't. She wanted me to amount to something. Oh, but you have. You've amounted to a lot. <laughs> I'm just a very ordinary man. I I bet your mother's real proud of you, Uncle Peck. <laughs> Thank you. The service was exceptional. Keep the change. Thank you, sir. Will you be needing any help? No, I think we can manage. Thank you. Thanks, too! <laughs> <laughs> Once I'll drink an entire regiment of British officers on a goodwill visit to Washington, every last man of them. No toast! How'd they ever kick Hitler's bonus, huh? <laughs> no match for an American lady. I can drink every man in here on the table. <laughs> So tight that only a surgical knife <laughs> <laughs> or a cinnamon torch <laughs> can get it off you. So that if you do pass out the arms of your escort, <gasps> he'll be sure to get rubber burns on his fingers before he can smell your virtue. Vehicle failure. Even with careful maintenance and preventive operation of your automobile, it is all too common for us to experience an unexpected breakdown. If you are driving at any speed when a breakdown occurs, you must slow down and guide the automobile to the side of the road. Feeling sick? Mm -hmm. All right, well, just settle there until things stop spinning. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? Well, we're just going to sit here until your tummy settles. Ooh, it's such nice upholstery. <laughs> Think you can go for a ride right now? Where are you taking me? <laughs> Home. You're not taking me upstairs. <laughs> There's no room at the end. <laughs> do, do you want to go upstairs? Or do you want to go home? The 
This isn't right, Uncle Pet. What isn't right? What we're doing. It's wrong. It's, it's very wrong. What, what are we doing? We're, we're just going out to dinner. You know, it's, it's not nice to Aunt Mary. You let me be the judge of what's nice and not nice to my wife. Now you're mad. A well, little bit. I'm, I'm not mad. It's just... I thought you understood me. Some days I, I think you're the only one who does. Someone will get hurt. Have I forced you to do anything? I guess not. We're just enjoying each other's company. I know we're not going to do anything until... Nothing is going to happen until you want it to happen. You know that? Yes. Nothing is going to happen until you want it to happen. Do you want something to happen? I don't know. Then I can wait. <laughs> I don't mind waiting. I'm a very patient man. I, I don't mind waiting. So someone will get hurt. No one is going to get hurt. Are you feeling sick? Sleepy. Wait there a second. Where are you going? I just, I just need to get someone from the back seat. What? What are you going to do? Thinking in sleep? Idling in the neutral gear. Uncle Peck teaches Cousin Bobby how to fish. I get back once or twice a year, supposedly to visit Mama and the family. But the real truth is to fish. I miss this most of all. There's a smell in the low country, where the swamp and fresh inlet join the salt water, a scent of sand and cypress that, that I haven't found anywhere yet. I don't say this very often up north, because it'll just play into everyone's stereotype. But I will tell you, I didn't wear shoes in the summertime until I was 16. <laughs> It's unnatural down here to pin up your feet in leather. Go ahead, take them off. Let yourself breathe. It really will make you feel better. We're going to have some pompano today, and I have to tell you, they're a very shy, mercurial fish. It takes patience and psychology. You have to believe it doesn't matter if you catch one or not. The sky's pretty spectacular. There's some beer in the cooler next to the crab salad I packed, so help yourself if you're hungry. Are you hungry? Thirsty? All of you are. OK, now you don't want to lean over the bridge like that. Pompano feet in shallow water, and you don't want to get too close. OK, now, look at your line. Yep, something was munching while we were talking. OK, look, you take the sand flea, and you take the hook like this right through his little sand flea rump. <laughs> sand flea should always keep their backs to the wall. OK, now, cast it in like I showed you. That's great! I can taste that pompano already, sauteed with some pecans and butter, a little bourbon. OK, now, let it lie on the bottom. Now, real jerk, real jerk. Look, look at your lana. There's something calling, all right. OK, now, tip the rod up, not too sharp. Hook it. All right, now easy. Reel, and then rest. Let it play, and reel. Good, play it out, yes. All right, good job. I can't believe it. It's a pompano. Way to go. Great work. You are an official fisherman now. Pompano are hard to catch. We are going to have ourselves a delicious little. What? 
well, I, I don't know how much pain a fish feels. You can't think of that. Oh, oh no, don't, don't cry. <laughs> Come on now, it's just a fish. <laughs> the other guys are going to see you. <laughs> no, no, it, you're just real sensitive, and I think that's wonderful at your age. Look, do you want me to cut it free? You do? Okay, hand me those pliers. Okay, look, I'm, I'm cutting the hook, okay? And then we're just gonna drop it in. No, I'm not mad. It's just for fun, okay? There. It's gonna swim back to its lady friend and tell her what a terrible day it had. And then she's going to stroke him with her fins until he feels better. And then they're both going to do something together that'll both make them feel good and sleepy. <laughs> Look, I, I don't want you to feel ashamed for crying. I I'm not going to tell anyone, okay? I can keep secrets. You know, men cry all the time. They just don't tell anybody and they don't let anybody catch them. There's nothing you could do that would make me feel ashamed of you. Do you know that? Okay. Do you want to pack up and call it a day? I, I tell you what, I think I can still remember there used to be a really neat tree house around here that I used to stay for days. I think it's still here, but it was the last time I looked but it's a secret place. So you can't tell anybody we've gone there, least of all your mother or your sisters. This is something special just between you and me. Sound good? We'll climb up there and have ourselves a beer and some crab salad. Okay, BB? Bobby? Robert? grandfather only cares that I do two things, have the table set and the bed turned down. And in all that time, Mother, you've never experienced... Now, my grandmother believed in all the sacraments of the church until the day she died. She believed in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny until she was 16, but she didn't believe in... Oh, gasms! That's just something you were married made of. I don't believe you. Mother, it happens to women all the time. Oh, so now you're going to tell me about the... the deep force. Uh, no, Grandma. <laughs> Well, Mama, after all, you were a child bride when Big Papa came and got you. You were a married woman, and you still believed in Santa Claus. It was legal what Daddy and I did. I was 14, and in those days, 14 was a grown-up woman. Oh, now we're off on Grandma and the rape of the Sabine women. Well, you were the one in such a big hurry. I chose you out of that herd of sisters like the lion chooses a gazelle. The slow, plump, flaky gazelle that dawdles at the edge of the herd. Your sisters were too fast, too smart, and too scrawny. Now the family story is that when Big Papa came to pick up Grandma, my Aunt Lily was waiting for him with the broom, and she beat him all the way down the stairs as he was carrying out Grandma's hope chest. And they was mean, especially Lily. Well, you were robbing the baby of the family. I still keep a broom handy in the kitchen, and I know how to use it, so get your hand out of the cookie jar, and don't you spoil your appetite for dinner. Go on out of the kitchen. Just one thing a married woman needs to know how to use, the rolling pin or the broom. I prefer a heavy cast iron frog pan. They are great on a man's head, no matter how thick the skull is. Your father is ruled by two bosses, Mr. Gut and Mr. Peter, and sometimes first thing in the morning, Mr. Spanker Muscle. Oh. It's 
true. Men are like children, just like little boys. Men are bulls, big bulls. They'd still be crouched on their haunches over a fire in a cave if we hadn't cleaned them up. Coming in smell of sweat. Looking at those naughty pictures like boys in a dime store with a dollar in their pockets. And no matter to them what they smell like, they've just got to have it right then, on the spot, right then, nasty. Vulgar. Primitive. Hot. And just about then, uh, a big papa would shuffle in with. What are you all cackling about in here now? Lucy, you'd better not be filling Mama's head with sex. Every time you and Mary come in and start in about sex, when I ask a simple question like, what time is dinner going to be ready? Mama snaps my head off. Dinner will be ready when I'm good and ready. Stay out of the kitchen. When making a left turn, you must downshift while going forward. to read when a young man sat beside me. What are you reading? He asked. His voice broke into that miserable equivalent of vocal acne, not quite falsetto and not tenor either. I glanced a side view. He was appealing in an odd way, huge ears springing forward at a defiant angle of 90 degrees. He must have been shaving too because his face, with a peach sheen, was speckled with Nixon's diptych. I have a class tomorrow, I told him. You're uh, taking a class? I'm teaching a class. He concentrated on lowering his voice. I'm, uh, I'm a senior. Walt Whitman High. The light was fading outside, so perhaps he was, with just a very high voice. I felt his interest quicken. Five steps ahead of the hopes in his head, I slowed down, pretended surprise, acted at listening, all while knowing we would get off the bus. He would just then seem to think to ask me to dinner. He would shiverously insist on walking me home. He would continue to converse in the street until I would casually invite him up to my room. And I was only into the second moment of conversation and I could see the whole evening before me. And dramaturgically speaking, after the faltering and slightly comical first act, there was the briefest of intermissions, and then a very sustained and capable and forceful second act, and after the second act climax, and a gentle denouement before the post-play discussion. I lay on my back in the dark, and, and I thought about you, Uncle Peck. Oh, oh, this is the allure. Uh, being older, being the first, the translator, the teacher, the epicure, the already jaded. This is how the giver gets taken. On Men, Sex, and Women, Part Two. You've been mighty quiet, Missy. Can I got your tongue? I'm just listening, just thinking. Oh, yes. Little Miss Radar ears, just soaking it all in. Little Miss Sponge. Penny for your thoughts? Does it, you know, when you do it, theoretically, when I do it, and I haven't done it before, does it hurt? <laughs> does what hurt, honey? When a girl, does it for the first time with a boy. Does it hurt? That's what you're thinking about? Well, just a little bit like a pinch and there's a little blood. Don't be telling her that. She's too young to be thinking those things. Well, if she doesn't find out from me, where's she gonna find out in the streets? Tell her it hurts. It's agony. You think you're going <laughs> to die, especially if you do before marriage. Mama, I'm going to tell her the truth. Unlike you, you left me and Mary completely in the dark of fairy tales and told us to go to the priest. <laughs> what does an 80 year old priest know about lovemaking with girls? It's not fair. Now see, she's getting upset. You're scaring her. Well, good. Let her be good and scared. It hurts. You bleed like a stuck pig and then you lie there and think, why? Oh, Lord, have you forsaken me? It's not fair. <laughs> Wonderful. 
people out for the pain to sign. You're encouraging her to go out and find out what the next drugstore joke who buys her a milkshake. <laughs> If the man you go to bed with loves you, it's important that he loves you. Why don't you just go out and rent a motel room for her, Lucy? <laughs> I believe in telling my daughter the truth. We have a very close relationship. I'm not scaring her with stories about Eve's sin or snakes crawling on their bellies for eternity or women bearing children in mortal pain. If she stops and thinks before she takes her niggas off, maybe someone in this family will finish high school. Mother, if you and daddy had helped me, then maybe I would have had to marry that, that no good son Oh, but he was good enough for you on a full moon. I hope you're responsible. You could have helped me. You could have told me something about the facts in life. I told you what my mother told me. A girl with a skirt up can outrun any man with his pants down. And when I went to you for a little bit of help, all I got was... You made your bed, now lie on it. Oh, please! I still can't bear to listen to it after all these years. Shoo-doo, shoo-be-doo. Shoo-doo, shoo-be-doo. Shoo-doo, shoo-be-doo. Shoo-doo, shoo-be-whoa. Shoo-doo, shoo-be-doo. Yourself think. Before you drive, always check under your car for obstructions, broken bottles, fallen tree branches, and the bodies of small children. Each year, hundreds of children are crushed beneath the wheels of unwary drivers in their own driveways. Children depend on you to wash them. You and the reverse gear. Nineteen sixty seven, on the back roads of Carolina, the initiation into a boy's first love. Of course, my favorite car will always be the fifty six Bel Air Sports Coupe. Chevy sold more fifty five, but the fifty six, a V eight with Corvette option, two hundred and twenty five horsepower, went from zero to sixty in eight point nine seconds. Long after a mother's tits, but before a woman's breasts. Super turbo fire, what a power pack. Mechanical lifters. Twin four-barrel carbs, uh, lightweight valves, dual exhausts. After the milk, but before the beer. A specific intake manifold, higher lift camshafts, and the tightest squeeze Chevy ever made. Long after he squeezed down the birth canal, but before he's forced his way back up. The boy falls in love with the thing that bears his weight with speed. I want you to know your automobile inside and out. Little bit. Are you there? What? You're drifting. I need you to concentrate. Uh, sorry. Okay, get in the driver's seat. Okay, now show me what you're gonna do before you start the car. I don't know, Uncle Peck. Come on now, what's the first thing you're going to adjust? My bra strap? A little bit. What's the most important thing you have control of on the inside of the car? That's easy. The radio. I changed it from Mother's old fart tunes to... Radio off. Right now. When you're driving your car with your license, you can fiddle with the stations all you like. But when you're driving my car with a learner's permit, I want all your attention on the road. Yes, sir. Okay, now seat forward and up. You need a cushion? No, I'm good. You should be able to reach all the switches and controls. Your feet should be able to push the accelerator, brake, and clutch all the way down. Can you do that? Yes. All right, now, the side mirrors. You want to be able to see just a bit of the right side of the car in the right mirror. Can you? Turn it out a little bit more. How's that? A little bit more. That's good. Now the left. Again, you want to be able to see behind you with the left side of the car. Adjust until you're comfortable. Now, I want you to check your rear view mirror. Angle it so you have a clear vision of the back. Now, lock your doors. Make sure all the doors are locked. But 
But then I'll be locked in here with you. Don't fool. All right. We're locked in. Now, we'll get to the air vent and defroster later. I'm teaching you on a manual, so as soon as you learn it, you'll be able to drive anything. I want you to be able to drive any car, any machine. Manual gives you control if there's ice on the roads, if your brakes fail, if you need more power. It's a little harder at first, but then it's just like breathing. Okay, now, hands on the wheel. I never want to see you driving with one hand, always two. What, what is it now? If I put both hands on the wheel, how do I defend myself? A little bit. Listen, listen up close. We are not going to fool around with this. I promise you, I will never touch you while you are driving a car. Understand? Okay. Hands on the 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock position. Give you maximum control in turn. Okay, now just relax and listen. I want you to lift your hands and look at them. Those are your two hands. When you're driving, your life is in your own two hands. Understand? I don't have any sons. You're the nearest to a son I'll ever have. And I want to, to give you something. Something that really matters to me. There's something about driving when when you're in control of the car, just you and the machine and the road, something that nobody can take away from you, a power. I feel more myself in my car than anywhere else. And that's what I want to give to you. There's a lot of assholes out there. Crazy men, arrogant idiots, drunks, angry kids, blind geezers, and and you have to be ready for them. I'm going to teach you to drive like a man. What does that mean? Men are taught to drive with aggression, with confidence. The road belongs to them. They drive defensively, always looking out for the other guy. Women tend to be polite, to hesitate. And that can be fatal. You're going to know what the other guy is thinking before he even does it. If there's an accident, if 10 cars pile up and people die, you're going to be the one to walk away, steer through, push your, put your foot on the gas if you have to, and be the only one to steer away. I don't know how long you or I have to live, but we are for damn sure not going to die in a car. Now, if you're going to drive with me, I want you to take this very seriously. I will, Uncle Peck. I, I want you to teach me to drive. Good. You're going to pass your test on the first try. Perfect score. Before these next four weeks are up, you are going to know this baby inside and out. <coughs> Treat her with respect. Why is it a she? Good question. Uh -huh. Doesn't have to be a she, but... When you close your eyes and you think of someone who performs just for you, who responds to your touch and gives you just what you want, I guess I always just see a she. You can call her what you like. I closed my eyes and I decided not to change the gender. Defensive driving involves defending yourself from hazardous and sudden changes in your automotive environment. By thinking ahead, the defensive driver can adjust to weather, road conditions, and road kill. Good defensive driving involves mental and physical preparation. Are you prepared? You and the reverse gear. of the female body in ninth grade, or a walk down mammary lane. In the hallway of Francis Scott Key Middle School. She's coming. <laughs> Jerome, Jerome, are you all right? 
don't know. I can't breathe. Can you get a little bit? He I can't. needs oxygen. <laughs> can you help us here? What's wrong? Do you need me to get the school nurse? No. No, it's okay. I only get this way when I'm around an allergy trigger. Holly, what are you allergic to? Bone rubber! <laughs> Jerome! Creep! Cran! Cro-Magnon! Rage is not attractive in a girl. Really, get a sense of humor. Good defensive driving involves mental and physical preparation. Were you prepared? Gym class. In the shower. The water looks hot. Yes. Well, I guess we'd better shower and get out of here. Um, yeah, you go ahead. I'm still cooling off. Okay. Uh, Sally, are you going to shower? After you. Oh, 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 oh my gosh, can you believe? <laughs> Told you it's not the mother I win. Jerome owes me 50 cents. <laughs> Were you prepared? The sock hop. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but do you ever feel like you're just a walking Mary Jane joke? I don't know what you mean. But you've never heard the Mary Jane jokes? Okay, so little Mary Jane is walking through the woods when all of a sudden this man, who was hiding behind a tree, jumps out, rips open Mary Jane's blouse, and plunges his hands on her breasts. And little Mary Jane just laughed and laughed because she knew her money was in her shoes. <laughs> you. Weird. Well, don't you ever feel self-conscious? Like, you're being looked at all the time? Um, that's not a problem for me. <gasps> oh, look! Craig's coming to ask you to dance! <laughs> Hi, Craig. Good evening. Uh, care to dance? I'm very complimented, Greg, but I think I'm going to sit this one out. Oh, uh, that's okay. I I'll try my luck later. Oh, take pity on him. Someone should. Oh, he's so short. <laughs> he can't help it. <laughs> but his head comes up to here, and I think he asked me in all the fast dances so he can watch me, you know, jiggle. I wish I had her problem. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening again. Uh, may I ask you for the honor of a spin on the floor? Thank you very much, Greg, but I just don't do fast dances. Oh, uh, no problem. That's okay. That is just so sad. You know, you should take it as a compliment that guys want to watch you jiggle. Mm-hmm. They're guys. That's what they're supposed to do. I guess you're right. Uh, but sometimes I feel like these alien life forces, these two mounds of flesh, have grafted themselves onto my chest, and they're using me to propagate so they can take over the world while they just keep getting bigger. And, and I just collapse under their weight, and they suck out all the nourishment out of my body, and then I just waste away while they keep getting bigger and bigger. And the strangest girl I've ever met. Uh, or, or maybe someone's implanted radio transmitters into my chest at a frequency I can't hear, and that girls can't detect. But they're sending out these signals to men who get mesmerized like sirens, calling themselves to dash on these rocks. Uh, this is a slow one. I, I hope your dance card isn't filled. Greg, you're a really nice boy, but I just don't like to dance. Oh, that, that's okay. We don't have to move or anything. I could just hold you, and then we could sway a no! little. No! I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I hear someone calling me. I have to go. In every man's home, some small room, some zone in his house is set aside. It could be the attic, or the study, or the den. But there's an invisible sign on the door as if from the old treehouse. Girls keep out. Here, away from female eyes, lace doilies and crochet, he keeps his manly toys. The Vargas pinups, the tackle, a sense of tobacco and WD-40. 
a touch of his bay rum. Here, he keeps his secrets. A violin or saxophone, a drum set or dark room, the stacks of Playboy. Here, in my aunt's home, it was the basement, Uncle Peck's turf. You and the reverse gear. 1965, the photo shoot. Are you cold? The latch will heat up some in a few minutes. Aunt Mary is... At the National Theater matinee. With your mother. They won't bother us. But what if... So what if they return? I told them that you'd be helping me with my camera. They won't come down here. Listen, are you sure you want to do this? I said I'd do it. But... I know. You've drawn the line. That's right. No frontal nudity. Good heavens, girl. What did you pick that up? I read. And I read Playboy for the interviews. Look, let's change the music. I didn't know you listened to this. I'm not dead, you know. I try to keep up. Do you like this song? Good. Now listen a little bit. At professional photo shoots, they always play music for the models. Okay? I want you to listen to the music. Feel it with your body and just respond. Respond to the music with my body. That's right. Almost like dancing. Here. Let's get you on the stool first. But nothing's showing. Nothing's showing. Just a peek. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm going to keep talking to you. I want you to listen to me without responding to what I'm saying. You want to listen to the music. Sway. Move just your torso or your head. I got to check the light meter. But you'll be watching. No. I'm not here. Just my voice. Pretend you're in your room all alone on a Friday night with your mirror. And the music feels good. Just move from me a little bit. That's it. That looks great, okay. Just keep doing that. Try lifting your head a bit. Good, good. Just keep moving. That a girl. You know, you're a very beautiful young lady. You know that? No, I don't know that. Keep listening to the music. Well, you are. For a 13-year-old, you have a body a 20-year-old would die for. The boys in school don't think so. Well, the boys in school are little Neanderthals in short pants. <laughs> They've got a lot of catching up to do. You're 10 years ahead of them in maturity. Girls turn into women long before boys turn into men. Why is that? I don't know a little bit, but it's a blessing for men. Keep moving. All right. Try arching your back on the stool, hands behind you. Throw your head back. Oh, great, that's great. Now, uh, turn your head away, same position. Beautiful. I think Aunt Mary's beautiful. My wife's a very beautiful woman. Her beauty doesn't cancel yours out. All the women in your family are beautiful. In fact, I think all women are. You're not listening to the music. Now, 
Turn your head to the left. All right, now I want you to take your right hand, the back of your right hand, and place it on your right cheek. Elbow angled up. Now slowly, slowly stroke your cheek. Draw back your hair with the back of your hand. Okay, great. Now, one hand above and behind your head. All right, now stretch your body. Smile. A little bit, I want you to think of something that makes you laugh. I can't think of anything. Okay. Think of Big Papa chasing Grandma around the living room. <laughs> great. That's great. Same position, head behind, hand behind your head. You're doing great work. If we keep this up, in five years, you'll have a really professional portfolio. <laughs> what do you mean, five years? Well, you can't submit work to Playboy until you're 18. Wait. You're joking, aren't you, Uncle Peck? Heck no. You can't get into Playboy unless you're the very best, and you are the very best. I would never do that! Why? There's nothing wrong with Playboy. It's a very classy but magazine. I thought you said I should go to college! Well, wait a little bit. It's nothing like that. Very respectable women model for Playboy, actresses with major careers, women in college, there's an Ivy League issue but every year. But I would year. never do anything like that! You would show other people these other men and these, well, what I'm doing. Anyone could just go to the store and go pick up one of these. Why would you ever want to do, to, to share something Whoa, like this? Whoa, not a little bit. Just listen. Stop a second and listen a little bit. Listen. There's nothing wrong in what we're doing. I'm very proud of you. I think you have a wonderful body and, and an even more wonderful mind. And of course I want other people to appreciate it. It's nothing shameful. But this is something that I'm doing only for you. This is something that you said was just between us. It is. And if that's how you feel five years from now, it will remain that way. I know you're not going to do anything you don't feel like doing. Do you want to stop now? I've only got a few shots left on this roll. I don't want anyone seeing this. They won't. I swear. I will treasure this. That you're doing it just for me. little bit. I need you to open your eyes and look at me. Come on now, just open your eyes, honey. If I look at you, if, if I look at the camera, you'll know what I'm thinking. You'll see right through me. No, I won't. I just want you to look at me. All right then, just listen. Little bit. I love you. Do you know that? I have loved you every day since the day you were born. Yes. Implied consent. As an individual operating a motor vehicle in the state of Maryland, you must abide by applied consent. If you do not consent to take the blood alcohol content test, there may be severe penalties, a suspension of license, a fine, community service, and a possible jail sentence. Idling in the neutral gear. Aunt Mary, on behalf of her husband. My husband was such a good man, is, he is such a good man. Every night he, he comes home 
he does the dishes. The second he comes home, he takes out the garbage or does the yard work or he's lifting the heavy things that I just can't. Everyone in the neighborhood borrows pack. It's true. Women with husbands of their own. Men who just don't have pecs abilities. There's always a knock on our door for a jump start on cold mornings or whenever someone needs a ride or, or help shoveling snow. <laughs> I look out and there Peck is without his coat pitching in. I know I'm lucky. The man works from dawn to dusk in the, the overtime that he does every year. My poor sister, she sits every Christmas when I come in with a new stole or diamonds or tickets to Bermuda. <laughs> I know he has his troubles, but we don't talk about them. Sometimes I, I wonder what happened to him during the war. The men who fought in World War II didn't have rap sessions where they could talk about their feelings. The men of his generation were expected to be quiet about it and get on with their lives. And sometimes I, I can see him fighting. Whatever's burrowed deeper than the scar tissue and we don't talk about it. I, I know he's having a bad spell because he comes looking for me in the house and just hangs around me until it passes. So I keep my banter light and I discuss a new recipe or sales or gossip because I believe that domesticity can be a bomb for men who are lost. So we sit in the house and we listen to the piece of the clock tick and in his well-ordered living room until it passes. I'm not a fool. I know what's going on. I wish you could see how hard Peck fights against it. He's swimming against the tide and, and what he needs to see is me on the shore, believing in him, knowing that he won't go under. He won't give up. And I want to say this about my niece. She is a sly one. That one is. She has twisted Peck around her little finger and thinks it's all some big secret. Yet another one who's borrowing my husband until it doesn't suit them anymore. Well, I'm counting the days until she goes away to school and she finds someone else to manipulate. And then he'll come back to me and he'll sit in the kitchen with me when I bake or next to me on the sofa when I sew in the evenings. I'm a very patient woman, but I'd like my husband back. I'm counting the days. You and the reverse gear. Little bits, 13 Christmas. Uncle Peck does the dishes. Christmas, 1964. I think it's really nice. I watched it on her feet all day. So did your mother and your grandmother. I know. Do you want some help? No. You can help by just talking to me. 
Mm. Big Papa never does the dishes. I think it's really nice. I think men should be nice to women. They're always working for us. And there's nothing particularly manly in wolfing down a bunch of food and sitting in the stupa while the women clean up. That's a really nice camera, Aunt Mary got you. It is. It's a very nice one. Did Big Papa hurt your feelings? What? Oh no. It doesn't hurt me. I'd rather have him picking on me than... I don't pay him any mind, little bit. Are you angry with us? I'm not angry. Well, we missed you at Thanksgiving. I did. I missed you. Well, there were things going on. I, I didn't want to ruin anyone's Thanksgiving. Please don't drink any more tonight. I'm not overdoing it. I know. Why do you drink so much? Well, a little bit. Let me explain it like this. There are some men, some people, and they have a, a fire in their belly. I think they go to work on Wall Street or run for office. And then there are some people, and they have a fire in their head. They become historians or scientists or writers. You, you've got a fire in the head. And then there are people like me. Where do you have a fire? I've got a fire in my, in my heart. And sometimes the drinking helps. No, there, there's got to be other things that can help. I suppose there are. Does it help to talk to me? Yes, it does. I, I don't get to see you very much. I, I know. You could talk to me more. Oh? I, I can make a deal with you, Uncle Peck. I'm listening. We, we could meet up. You could just store up whatever's bothering you during the week, and then we could just talk about it. Would you like that? As, as long as you stop drinking. We, we, we'd meet somewhere for, for a walk or lunch or on the weekends, but. You have to stop drinking. Then we can just talk about whatever you want. You would do that for me? Uh, I wouldn't want Mom to know, or, or Aunt Mary. I just wouldn't want them to think. No, we would just be talking. I'll tell Mom I'm going to a girlfriend's house to study. She doesn't get home until 6, so you can call me after school and tell me where to meet you. You get home at 4? Uncle Peck, we can meet once a week. And, and only in public. You you have to let me draw a line. And once it's drawn, you mustn't cross it. Understood. Would that help? Yes. Very much. I'm going to go sit with the others in the living room now. Merry Christmas, little bit. Merry Christmas, Uncle Peck. Shifting forward from second to third gear. Nineteen sixty nine. Days and Gifts. A countdown. September third, nineteen sixty nine. A note. Little bit. You've only been away two days, and it feels like months. Hope your dorm room is cozy. I'm sending you this tape cassette. It's a new model, so you'll have some music for your dorm room. Also, that music you're reading about for class, Carmina Barana. Hope you enjoy. Only 90 days to go. Peck. 
September 22nd, a bouquet of roses, a note. Miss you like crazy, only 69 days. September 25th, a box of chocolates, a note. Don't worry about the weight gain, you'll still look great. Got a post office box, write to me there. Only 66 days, love, your candy man. October 16th, a note. I'm trying to get through the Jane Austen you're reading, Emma. Here's a book in return, Liaisons d'Andre. Hope you're saving time for me. Scrawled in the margin, the number 47. November 16th, 16 days to go. I hope you like the perfume. I'm having a hard time reaching you on your dorm phone. You must be in the library a lot. Won't you think about me getting you your own phone so we can talk? November 18th, little bit. Got a package returned to the P.O. box. Have you changed dorms? Call me at work or write to the P.O. I'm still on the wagon, waiting to see you. Only two weeks more. November 23rd, a note. Little bit, so disappointed you couldn't make it home for the turkey. I'm sending you some money for a nice dinner out. Nine days and counting. November 25th, a letter. Dear Uncle Pat, I'm writing this to you at work. Don't come up next weekend for my birthday. I won't be here. Shifting forward from third to fourth year. December 10th, 1969, a hotel room, Philadelphia. There is no moon tonight. Why don't you sit? I don't want to. What's the champagne for? I thought we could toast your birthday. I am so pissed off at you, Uncle Peck. Why? I mean, are you crazy? What did I do? You scared the holy crap out of me, sending me all that stuff in the mail. They were gifts, little perks to help you through your first semester. Well, what the hell were all those numbers all about? Only 44 days to go, only two more weeks, and, and just numbers. 69, 68, 67, like some serial killer. Well, little bit, this is me you're talking to. I was just trying to lift your spirits, trying to celebrate your birthday. My 18th birthday. Uncle Peck, I'm not a child anymore. You were counting down to my 18th birthday. So? So? So statutory rape is not in effect when a young woman turns 18. And you and I both know it. I, I think you misunderstand. I think I understand all too well. I know what you're going to do five steps ahead of you doing it. Defensive driving 101. Then why did you have me come up here instead of beating you at the restaurant? I wrong? don't want to have this conversation in public! Fine. Fine. We have a lot to talk about. Yeah, we do. Could I maybe have some of that champagne? Of course, madam. I, I wasn't sure which you would prefer. Uh, Tetinger or Bouffe Clicquot, so I thought we could go with an old standard, Perrier Jouet. <clears throat> Quick little bit of glass. Now let me just get this ginger ale here, my bubbly, and toast to you. Sorry, Uncle Peck, pour me another. Uncle Peck, maybe you should join me in the champagne? You, uh, you want me to drink? 
It's not polite to let a lady drink alone. Well, Missy, if you insist. Just one. It's been a while. There. Now, I would like to propose a toast to you and your birthday. I'm not used to this. Uncle Peck, you don't have anywhere to go tonight, do you? I'm all yours. It's, God, it's so good to see you again. I've gotten so used to, to, to talking to you in my head. I'm so used to seeing you every week. I, I don't qu quite know where to begin. How school a little bit? It's hard. It's harder than I thought it would be. I, I'm in the middle of exams and, and papers. And, I, I don't know. You'll pull through. You always do. Maybe. I, I think I might be flunking out. But you always think the worst. But when the going gets tough... Now, go easy on that stuff, okay, honey? Is it very expensive? Only the best for you. But the cost doesn't matter. Champagne should be sipped. Look, if you're in trouble in school, you can always come back home for a while. No! Thank you, Uncle Peck, but I'll figure a way out of this. You're supposed to get in scrapes your first year away. Right. How's Aunt Mary? She's fine. What do you think of the new car? It's really nice. What is it again? A Cadillac Eldorado. Right, well, I'm really happy for you, Uncle Peck. I got it for you. When? Well, I, I always wanted a Cadillac, but then I thought to myself, Peck, wait till a little bit's older. And I thought, maybe you'd like to drive it too. Why would I want to drive your car? Well, only because it's the best. You deserve the very best. Look, Listen, I've been thinking Uncle how to say this over and over my head, and I'm sorry. You first. Well, your going away has just made me realize how much I miss you, talking to you and being alone with you. I I've really come to depend on you a little bit, and it's been so hard to get a hold of you. You're never in when I call, and at the distance, and I guess you've just been living in the library. No. The problem is I haven't been in the library. Well, it doesn't matter. I hope you're missing me as much. Uncle Peck, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I came here tonight to tell you that I'm not doing very well. I, I'm getting very confused. I can't concentrate on my work. And, and now that I'm away, I've been going over and over it in my mind. And, and I don't want to see you anymore, Uncle Peck, other than with the rest of the family. Will you see another man? No, oh, that's not what this is. I mean, well, there are other, but... Listen, that's not really anybody's business. Are you in love with anyone else? That's not what this is about! <laughs> You're scared, little bit. I hear your mother and your grandparents working you on, on you all the time, and they're filling your head with all kinds of nonsense about men, and you're scared. But it won't hurt you if the man you go to bed with really loves you, and I have loved you. Every day since the day I, I held you in my hand, and, and and I think everyone's just gotten you so scared about something that's just like breathing. Oh my God! I can't see you anymore, Uncle Ben.
a little bit. Listen. Listen. Open your eyes and look at me. Come on, honey, just look at me. Okay, then, just listen. I'm gonna ask you this just once, of your own free will. Lie down on the bed with me. Um, just, just, just lie down, our clothes on. And then we can hold one another, nothing else. Before you say anything else, I just want the chance to hold you. Because sometimes the body knows things that the mind isn't listening to, and, and, and I just want to hold you, and then afterwards you can tell me what you feel. Hold me? Yes. And, and afterwards you can tell me what you feel. Yes. All right, just a hold. Nothing else. Recipe for a southern boy. A draw of molasses in the way she speaks. A gumbo of red and brown mixed in the cream of his skin. Warm brown eyes. Better than us. Da a dash of southern Baptist fire and brimstone. A curl of Elvis on his forehead. A splash of bay rum. A closely shaven beard that he raises just for you. Large hands. Rough hands. Warm hands. The steel of the military in his walk. The slouch of the fishing skiff in his walk. Neatly pressed khakis. And under the white leather of the belt. Sweat of cypress and sand. Neatly pressed khakis. His heart beating Dixie. And the whisper of the zipper. You could just reach out your hand and... His mouth. You could just reach out and... Hold him in your hand. And his mouth. Wait, little pig. Did you, did you feel nothing? No. N nothing. D do you. D do you think of me? Khakis. Hey, Rob. No. I'm 45. That, that, that's not old for a man. And I, and I haven't been able to do anything else but think of you and. I can't concentrate at work. Little bit, you've got to. I, I need you to think about what I'm about to ask you. I'm listening. I want you to be my wife. This isn't happening. I tell Mary I want a divorce. We're not blood related. It would be legal. What have you been thinking? Uncle Beck, you're married to my aunt. She is my family. You, you have gone way over the line. Family is family. I'm, I'm leaving. I, I'm not seeing you again. You should go home to Aunt Mary, Uncle Peck. Go home now. I'm not coming home for Christmas. Uncle Peck, I, I'm sorry, but I have to go. Are you all right? I'm fine. I, I just, I just think, I think I need a real drink. I never saw him again. from Christmas and Thanksgiving for years after. It took my uncle seven years to drink himself to death. So 
first he lost his job and and then his wife and, and, and finally his driver's license. He, he just retreated to his house and had his bottles delivered. One night he was going downstairs to the basement and, and he flew down the steep basement steps. Each week my aunt would come by and drop groceries up on the porch and she noticed that the papers and the mail were stacked up uncollected. They found him at the bottom of the stairs just steps away from the dark room. Now that I'm old enough, there, there are some questions I would have liked to have asked. Who did it to you? Uncle Peck? How old were you? Were you 11? I like to think of my uncle as a sort of flying Dutchman. In the opera, the Dutchman is doomed to wander the sea, but every seven years he can come ashore, and if he finds a maiden who will love him of her own free will, he will be released. And I see my uncle in my mind in his Chevy 56, a spirit driving up and down the back roads of Carolina, searching for a young girl who, of her own free will, will love him, release him. You and the reverse gear. The Summer of 1962, on Men, Sex, and Women, Part 3. It is out of the question. End of discussion. But why? A little bit. We are not discussing this. I said no. But you're not telling me why. Your uncle pays entirely too much attention to you. He listens to me when I talk, and, and he actually talks to me. Mama, he knows an awful lot. He's a small-town hick who's learned how to mix drinks with Hugh Hefner. Who's Hugh Hefner? I am not letting an 11-year-old girl spend seven hours alone in a car with a man. I don't like the way your uncle looks at you. Mother, just because you had a bad time with my father, you think every man is evil. No, little bit. Not all men. We. We just haven't been very lucky with the men in our family. Just because you were unlucky with your husband, I still deserve a chance at having a father. Someone who will look out for me. Don't I get a chance? I will feel terrible if something happens. Mother! It's in your head and nothing will happen. I can take care of myself and I can definitely take care of Uncle Peck. All right. But I am warning you. If anything happens, I'm holding you responsible. Nineteen sixty-two, on the back roads of Carolina, the first driving lesson. You feeling tired a little bit? A little. It's a long drive. But we're making really good time. We can take the back road from here and see a little scenery. Say, I got an idea. Are we stopping, Uncle Pat? There's no traffic here. You want to drive? I can't drive. It's easy. I'll show you. I learned to drive when I was your age. Don't you want to? But it's against the law at my age. And that's why you can't let anybody know that I'm letting you do this. But I can't reach the pedal. Well, you can sit on my lap and steer while I push the pedals. Does your father ever let you drive? His no car? way. You want to? OK. You're just a little thing, aren't you? OK, now, I want you to imagine that the steering wheel is a big clock. I want you to put your right hand on the clock where the three o'clock would be, and your left with a nine.
Am I doing it right? That's right. Now, whatever you do, don't let go of the wheel. You tell me whether to go fast or slow. Not so fast, Uncle Peck. A little bit. I need you to watch the road. Uncle Peck, what are you doing? Just keep driving. Uncle Peck, please don't do this. Just a little longer. This isn't happening. Uh, uh. Driving in today's world. That was the last day I lived inside my body. I retreated above the neck and lived inside the fire ever since. And now that seems like a long, long time ago, when we were both very young. And before you know it, I'll be 35. That's getting up there for a woman. And I find myself believing in things a younger self out never to believe. Things like family and forgiveness. I know I'm lucky, although I'll never know what it's like to dance or to jog, anything that jiggles. I do like to watch people out on the dance floor, though, or, or on the running path, just jiggling away. And I say, good for them. of flight inside the body, I guess I feel when I'm driving. On a day like today, it's 5 a.m. The radio says it's going to be clear and crisp. I've got 500 miles of highway ahead of me, and some back roads, too. I filled the tank last night, checked the oil. I checked the tires, too. You've got to treat her respect. The first thing I do is check under the car to make sure that no household cats or small children have strategically placed their heads beneath my back tires. Nope. Then I get in the car. I lock the doors, I turn the keys, then I adjust the most important control on the dashboard, the radio. You were so tiny, you fit in this hand. How is Shakespeare going to help her lie on her back in the... Am I doing it right? Aha. Uh -huh. That's better. I adjust my seat. Fasten my seatbelt. I check the right side mirror. I check the left side. Finally, I adjust the rear view mirror. And then I floor it. 